In 2008, Isabella de Oliveira Nardoni was five years old. She was born on the 18th of April 2002 and was the daughter of Alexandre Alves Nardoni and Ana Carolina Cunha de Oliveira. Both parents met at a very young age. Carolina got pregnant with Isabella when she was still young, at 17. Alexandre did not take the news of the pregnancy very well because, at the time, he was trying to get into law school. The relationship didn't last for long and the two broke up in January 2002, three months before Isabella was born. Even though the couple was no longer together, Alexandre used to visit his daughter once a week or sometimes stayed with her for the entire weekend. Few months Isabella came into the world, Alexandre started dating a new girl, Ana Carolina Jatobá. Carolina Jatobá was also a student in law and together the couple ended up having two children. The new family lived in a building in the city of São Paulo. Before I can continue, I have to make two things clear. First, as you can hear, the two women have the same name, but different surnames. However, Isabella's mother was not present on the day of the incident, and because of this, every time I refer to Isabella's mother, I will let you know. So, keep in mind that from now so on, when I say Ana Carolina, I mean Isabella's stepmother. And second, maybe you must be wondering why I don't say Carolina instead of Carolina. Well, some of you already know, I'm Brazilian, and because this case happened in Brazil, and I just recorded this same episode in Portuguese, for me, it's difficult to translate this name from Portuguese to English. I mean, I could do that, but at some point, without realizing it, I could end up saying Carolina, even later to be talking several times Carolina. So, hold my accent and hope that's not a problem. On March 29, 2008, just before midnight, the police and hospitals in the city of Vila Guilherme, São Paulo, received several calls reporting that a little girl had fallen from the balcony of a building. Police, fire and ambulance cars appeared at the scene. They found Isabella laying in the front yard. Alexandre and Carolina had been living on the sixth floor. A couple of neighbors from the building next door, security consultant Walter Rodriguez and the lawyer Ana Ferrari, arrived at the door of the building and managed to enter because the gate was opened. Walter could see Isabella on the ground, and as he gets closer, her father, Alexandre, started shouting that there was an armed person leaving his apartment and this man was the one who threw his daughter out of the window. Later, Alexandre was still talking to some people who were around Isabella, repeating the same things. Meanwhile, Carolina's stepmother was on the other side of the street, screaming and complaining about the safety of the place. Paramedics tried to revive the girl for a period of 34 minutes. Unfortunately, Isabella did not regain consciousness. After, the police spoke with the couple. Can you tell us what happened up to the time of the accident, please? We arrived at the building with our car. All the children were sleeping. I didn't want to wake Isabella, so I carried her myself, first on my lap, and then I went downstairs to help Carol with the other children and get things from the car. When we got to the apartment, Isabella wasn't there. The window grid was cut, and when I stuck my head out, I saw her down there. Between you leaving Isabella in the room, coming back, how long did it take? I don't know for sure. I think about five minutes. Isabella was taken to the hospital alive, but did not resist her injuries and died that same night. Preliminary investigations have begun, and at the first glance at the apartment, the police were already faced with contradictory information. 
the door was not broken into, as Alexandre had previously told the witnesses. In the following days, the couple, family members and many neighbors were interrogated to try to collect any clues to the solution of the case. Alexandre said to them he believes that the person who was in his apartment had a copy of the key because the door was not broken, contradicting what the witnesses heard him say. The couple added that perhaps the concierge could have a copy. In the early hours of March 31st, Alexandre and Carolina were released from the civil police station after more than 24 hours of testimony. Two days after, April 2nd, at the end of the afternoon, the jury court of São Paulo accepted the request for the couple's provisional arrest. Witnesses from the first building where the couple had been living before heard Carolina say that they were not happily married, that he had an ex-wife and that, unfortunately, there were ties that would never be untied. Already talking with the new neighbors, many said that the couple had routine fights with a lot of bad words and frequent screamings. Some even confirmed that they had even physically attacked each other. One of the couple's lawyers revealed to the press that Carolina had lost the keys a few days before the crime, but this turns out to be such strange information because how does someone who finds a random key know which house or apartment it belongs to? Two calls were made from the landline at the couple's apartment. This happened between the incident and the arrival of the first police cars. The first call that happened at 23 hours, 50 minutes and 32 seconds was made for Carolina's father and lasted 32 seconds. And the second call made at 23 hours, 51 minutes and 9 seconds to Alexandre's father, Antonio Nardoni, lawyer, lasted 29 seconds. Despite the competent bodies having received dozens of calls, none of them were made by either Alexandre or Ana Carolina. The expertise made by the police says that the balcony protection net was cut intentionally and that the cut rail belongs to Isabella's brother's room and not in the room where they said she was put to sleep. Likes of Isabella's blood were found in Alexandre's car, one of the pieces of evidence that she had arrived at the building injured. There were also drops of blood from the front door of the apartment on the floor of the brother's room and on the bed next to the window. They also found drops on one of Alexandre's slippers and on one of Carolina's shoes. All drops were visible, but the couple did not talk about it at any point in the dispositions. Security camera footage from a supermarket shows the couple with their children minutes before the incident. Isabella didn't seem hurt. So, something happened between the shopping and the incident. On Alexandre's shirt, stains of vomit that were identified as Isabella's and the mark of the protection net. Alexandre had already informed the police that he had put his head out of the window, but the force of the pressure exerted on the net left marks that, according to analysis, would only be possible if the person had pressed the body firmly against the protection net. Slipper marks, compatible with the ones Alexandre wore on the day of the incident, were found on the mattresses beside the window. A blood stain next to the sofa was removed by someone but identified using forensic equipment. The prosecutor assigned to the case stated that the evidence clearly indicates that they were talking about a crime and that the crime scene 
had been tampered with. The reports say that Isabella was struggled and had fainted. Marks on her neck were compatible with the size of her stepmother Carolina's hands. No strangers were seen in the building. The chance that the third person had committed the crime was completely ruled out. Isabella's mother, Ana Carolina Cunha, did not make public appearances during the investigations and restricted herself to giving her statements to the police. In one of them, she says that in her conception, she believes that Alexandre and Ana Carolina Jatobá could be somehow involved in what had happened. The police chief in charge stated that there were three points that, in his opinion, were more nebulous. The absence of a break-in in the house, the fact that nothing was missing among the couple's belongings, and finally, there was no indication that someone unknown had been in the house or in the building. After these and other surveys, Alexandre and Carolina were called to testify again on April the 18th, coincidentally the day Isabella would have turned six years old. Was your shirt dirty on the day of the incident? No, was not. But Isabella's vomit was found. How did that happen? I don't know. I, I didn't see her true up at all. The vomiting occurred after a response from her organism as a defense reaction while she was being asphyxiated. Don't you know anything about it? No. I don't know how it was found on my shirt. And uh, regarding Isabella's blood stains, how did that happen? I can't explain how it happened either. I carried her in my arms to the bedroom and she had no injuries. When I returned to the apartment after having been on the ground floor, I saw a drop in the boy's room, one on the sheet and the little on the window screen. The experts found blood on the floor of the living room, on the side of the sofa, but that trace was cleaned up. It was only identified with the use of luminol by the investigation team. Do you know anything about this? No, sir. I have not seen or cleaned it. I think whoever did this could have been the same person who went there to commit this crime. A drop of blood was also found on the right foot of your wife's shoe, and it was also confirmed that this blood is Isabella's. Do you know anything about this? Of course not, sir. About the footprint of your slipper on the bed sheet, next to the window from where Isabella was thrown, can you say anything about that? I don't usually step on the bed with the shoes that come from the street, but I, I, I only did that to reach the window and close it. A child safety window protection net mark was also found on your shirt. Can you explain to us how this happened? I don't know. Regarding the moment you left Isabella at your apartment to go down to the garage again and help Anna Carolina until you returned to the apartment when Isabella was no longer there, how long did that take? Well, uh, I think it was about 19, 20 minutes. 20 minutes? This is not what you said to the police on your first statement. I don't remember exactly. According to your car's tracker record, the duration between the moment the engine was turned off and the first distress call made by a third party lasted 13 minutes. So there's no way you could have spent 20 minutes in that interval. Right. It may have been 13 minutes. But in the interval, I believe someone entered the apartment without breaking down the door using a copy of a key, hurt Isabella, suffocated her, cut the protective screen, cleaned the blood, disappeared with the material he used to cut the screen, left the apartment and locked the door. Later, Carolina Jatobá was heard. My relationship with Isabella was great. We were close. I never had to scold her. Can you say anything about Isabella's injuries? I don't know. I didn't see her hurt at all before the fall. Bloodstains were found in the car. 
Can you give us any information about it? I don't know how to explain how this blood was found. Isabella's blood stain was also found on the right foot of your shoe. Can you tell us how that happened? Impossible. There is no way Francis could have found blood on my shoe. I arrived at the apartment wearing a clog. I left them in the kitchen. And after we realized what happened, I left the apartment barefoot. This shoe in question that is in the expert report, I only wore it in Guarulhos at my parents' house. And that was later. I really don't know how Isabella's blood ended up on that shoe. Isabella's vomit was found on your husband's shirt. Can you tell us how that happened? I don't know. Can you explain anything about the blood stains that were cleaned in the apartment? I can't explain. I wasn't the one who cleaned it. The marks on Isabella's neck resemble the size of your hands. Can you explain anything about this? I never did squeeze her neck. I didn't lay a finger on her. Because when I got to the apartment, everything had already happened. In the course of investigations, it was discovered that the first thing the boy's grandmother did, it's not clear if it was Alexandre or Carolina's mother, was remove the other two children from the house. The police understood that it was an act of protection to keep them away from their parents, because what better place could the children be if not next to the parents? In the service area of the apartment, a diaper was found inside a bucket as if it had been cleaned, which completely contrasted with the rest of the house, which was compared to a messy and filthy place. For example, food-stained shirts and urine and feces-stained shorts were strewn about, but the diaper that contained Isabella's blood sample was clean inside the bucket. The version that the investigation created to take it to trial was as follows. In the parking lot of the building, the three kids were probably fighting in the car and Carolina stressed hold Isabella's neck, the only one that wasn't her kid, and after hit her, probably holding the house keys, and that made her forehead become hurt. Isabella started screaming in pain so that she would stop calling the attention of the neighbors. Alexandre decided to shut the girl up. With a diaper in his hand, he covered her mouth, the same diaper that was later found clean in the apartment. Alexandre took Isabella to the apartment like that, preventing her from breathing properly. When he gets there, he throws her on the couch, but Isabella falls to the floor. At that moment, she vomited and apparently wasn't breathing. Doctors believe she was still alive, but as Alexandre and Carolina believed she wasn't, they decided to create a scenario where someone had entered the property and taken her life. So, they opened the window's safety net and simply released Isabella from the sixth floor. As the surviving siblings could not testify to the police as adults, they received specialized care with psychologists so that they gradually felt at ease and talked about the day of the incident. The most striking part was when one of them was asked what had happened to Isabella, and the child said, Daddy threw her out the window, and she turned into an angel. The police version, along with the brother's testimony, were taken to trial, and in the end, Alexandre Nardoni and Ana Carolina Jatobá both failed to prove their innocence, and the jury found the couple guilty of a triple aggravate homicide. Because the girl was suffocated, considered a bit cruel, had no chance of defense because she was unconscious when she fell out of the window, and because the homicide was committed with the purpose of hiding the previous aggression. 
Alexandre was sentenced to 31 years, one month, and 10 days in prison. During his sentence, he worked in prison setting up school desks for public schools, doing guarding, laundry, and cleaning work. On November 5, 2019, he got the right to parole and got a job as a general helper. He can leave the prison to work, but always need to come back to sleep there. Ana Carolina was sentenced to 26 years and 8 months in prison. She works as seamstress in the prison and also got approval to have her sentence served in a semi-open regime, with the right to leave prison for 5 days per year to visit her family. What became intriguing during her imprisonment was that Ana Carolina made friends with other prisoners and one of them was the mastermind of a crime that also shocked Brazil in the early 2000s. Suzanne von Richthofen, aged 19, ordered the execution of their own parents within their own home. I will bring this case to you soon. Nowadays, it's possible to see that Ana Carolina and Suzanne von Richthofen are friends and have already been spotted together several times in prison. Due to the distance restrictions adopted in 2020 for the safety of the population's health, the penitentiary started to adopt the use of video calls between the detainees and their lawyers. However, in May 2020, Ana Carolina broke one of the rules for using this method to talk with her father and children. With that, she lost the right to the same open regime and are not allowed to leave prison anymore. Although Ana Carolina de Oliveira, Isabella's mother, does not appear much in the media to talk about the case, as it is clear how much it hurt her, what we know is that she got married and has two children, a boy named Miguel, six years old, and a girl named Maria, three years old. <laughs>